The following pages were found in a shabby pocketbook. Their owner has never been traced, and inquiries have failed to discover his identity. Some of the pages were so damaged as to render them completely illegible. Thus, there are gaps, and much of it seems without sequence. Whether the wild improbabilities of the story are true, or whether the whole is but the hysterical product of a diseased mind, we shall never know. Signed, Dr. E. Strongman. I want to know if men realise when they are insane. Sometimes I think that my brain cannot hold together. It is filled with too much horror, too great a despair. I have never been so unutterably alone. Why should it help me to write this? Vomit forth the poison in my brain. I cannot sleep. I cannot close my eyes without seeing his face. I should have followed her to the ends of the earth. I should have taught her what it is to be loved by a man, yes, a man. And I would have thrown his filthy, battered body from the window, watched him disappear forever, his evil scarlet mouth distorted. Rebecca, I loved you too much. You have made of me a madman. If only I could be calm and clear for one moment. It was at Olga's studio first, I think. The room was full. Vorky was there, they were trying to make him sing, and Olga was screaming with laughter. You were sitting. Rebecca was sitting. On a stool by the fire. Her legs were twisted under her, and she looked like an elf, a sort of boy. I called out to Olga to introduce me. Rebecca, she said. Rebecca turned. Her eyes opened wide, and she smiled at me, biting her lip. She had the eyes of a visionary, of a fanatic. One lost oneself in them. It was like drowning. From the moment I saw her, I was doomed. I went to Olga's again, and she was there. She came right up to me and said, Do you care for music? She was a violinist, apparently, an orphan, and lived alone in Bloomsbury. She had travelled much, she said. She had lived in Budapest for three years, studying music. She left early that day, and I crossed the room to ask Olga about her. She comes from Hungary. Vorky brought her here. He found her in Paris, playing the violin in one of those Russian cafes. I left Olga's studio in a dream, with Rebecca's face dancing before my eyes. She was to play at Vorky's flat the following evening, and I went to hear her. I sat like a drugged man. I don't know what she played, but... I was not aware of anything but that I and Rebecca were together, out of the world, away, lost. You gave me a marvellous sensation when you played, I told her. It was beautiful, intoxicating. I shall never forget it. I played for you. I wanted to see what it was like to play to a man. Her words bewildered me. I want to see you again, I told her. I'd like to come and see you alone, where we can talk. She gave me her address. She would not be able to see me until the end of the week. The days that passed seemed interminable. On Friday I could stand it no longer, so I went to her. She opened the door and took me into a large bare room like a studio. This is where I practice, Rebecca told me. I found her strange, detached. Our conversation was forced. Before I left, she showed me round her flat. There was a kitchen, a pokey bathroom, and her own small bedroom, quite plain and bare. There was another room leading from the studio, but she did not show me this. It was obviously a fair-sized room, as I saw the window from the street afterwards and watched her draw the heavy curtains across it. Note. Here, some pages were completely illegible. The narrative appears to continue in the middle of a sentence. Dr. Strongman. Not really cold, she insisted. I've tried to explain to you that I'm odd in some ways. 
I've never been in love. I was becoming maddened by her indifference. It was not natural, but calculated. I felt I should never discover what was in her mind. I was tortured by doubt and jealousy. The thought of other men was driving me insane. I asked Olga about her, asked Vorky. No one could tell me anything. I'm forgetting days and weeks as I write this. Nothing seems to have any sequence for me. I had better write that Sunday now. I went to her flat about nine in the evening. She was waiting for me, dressed in scarlet. She seemed excited, intoxicated. She sat down at my feet with her legs tucked under her and giggled childishly. Then all at once she turned to me, her face pale, her eyes strangely alight. Is it possible to love someone so much that it gives one a pleasure, an unaccountable pleasure, to hurt them? To hurt them by jealousy, I mean. She puzzled me. Then she rose and went across the room to the door I had never yet seen opened. I want to introduce you to Julio, she said. She opened the door. I saw a low, round-shaped room whose walls were draped with velvet hangings. Near the fireplace was a divan, covered with cushions, and the only light came from a small shaded lamp. There was one chair in the room, and this was facing the divan. Something was sitting in the chair. I felt an eerie, cold feeling in my heart, as if the room were haunted. What is it? I whispered. Rebecca took the lamp and held it over the chair. This is Julio, she said softly. I stepped closer and saw what I took to be a boy of about sixteen, dressed in a dinner jacket, shirt and waistcoat and long Spanish trousers. His face was the most evil thing I have ever seen. It was ashen pale in colour, and the mouth was a crimson gash, sensual and depraved. The eyes were cruel and curiously still. There was no boy sitting in the chair. It was a doll. Human enough, lifelike, with a foul, distinctive personality. But a doll. Only a doll. I looked at Rebecca. She was watching my face. Where did you get this loathsome toy? The next moment the room was in darkness. She had turned out the lamp. I felt her arms round my neck and her mouth upon mine. Now shall I tell you I love you, she whispered. Shall I? A hot wave swept over me. The floor seemed to swing beneath my feet. She clung to me and kissed my throat. I could feel her fingers at the back of my neck. She kissed me again. It was devastating. It was madness. It was like death. I don't know how long we stood there. I don't remember anything. Only the silence, the beating of my heart, and Rebecca. Rebecca. When I raised my eyes above her head, I looked straight into his eyes, his damned doll's eyes. Come away, she said, and dragged me from the room. You must go now. I took my things and went. I walked all night. I watched the dawn break on Hampstead Heath. My body was cold, but my brain was on fire. From the moment she kissed me, I knew that she had lied to me. She had known five, ten, twenty lovers. And I was not one of them. I went home and slept. When I awoke, it was dark. I remember washing and then walking in the direction of Bloomsbury. I reached the flat and rang at her bell. She let me in without a word. I told her I was going to be her lover. There were red rims under her eyes. I bent towards her to kiss her, but she pushed me away. You must forget what happened last night, she said. Today I realize I made a mistake. I'm not well. You must leave me alone. I tried to seize her, but she lay cold and still in my arms. Her mouth was icy, and I left in despair. Then followed a week of doubt and torture. She never mentioned Julio. 
When I asked her what she had done with him, she would answer evasively and change the subject. I've now come to the very last evening. I was leaving the flat and she suddenly put her arms round me and kissed me. Call me a madman. But you have not kissed Rebecca, you cannot know. It was shattering. Who were your lovers? I said. Who taught you to kiss them like that? A haze of fury was before my eyes, my hands shook. I swear to you that you are the first man I have ever kissed. She looked straight at me. I saw that she was speaking the truth. Now you must go. I remember leaving the flat. My head was on fire. I couldn't sleep. At midnight I could stand it no longer. I had to go to Rebecca. I persuaded the night porter to let me in. I put my hand on the doorknob and turned it slowly. To my surprise it was not locked. I stepped inside. Everything was in darkness. Rebecca, I called softly. The door of her bedroom was open, but there was no one inside. Then I knew. Something gripped my heart, cold, clammy fear. I looked towards that other room, his room, Julio's room. I knew that Rebecca was in there with the doll, with Julio. I felt my way across the room and beat against the door. It was locked. I kicked against the panel. It gave way. I heard a cry of fury from Rebecca and she turned on the lamp. Oh, I shall never forget her eyes. The unholy rapture in her eyes and her ashen face. I saw everything. I knew everything. I was seized with a terrible despair. And all the time his vile, filthy face was looking at me, staring with a lifeless, glassy immobility. The wet, crimson mouth was sneering. He was not alive, not human, but terrible, ghastly. Rebecca turned to me. Her voice was cold, apart, unearthly. And you expect me to love you? Don't you see that I can't? How can I care for you or any man? Go away, leave me. I loathe you all. Something cracked inside my heart. I turned away. I ran into the street, tears pouring down my face. I went the next day and she had gone. They had both gone. I shall never see Rebecca again. It will always be Rebecca and Julio. They will haunt me. I shall never sleep. What am I going to do? I can't live. I can't cope. Ed Stoppard and Sean Baker were reading The Doll by Daphne du Maurier. It was abridged by Richard Hamilton. The producer was Elizabeth Allard.